Yes. I, I'm super excited about modularity and the enabling technology for uh, us working together. Uh, I know it's one of those things that's kind of, it's, it's been hard to share the user value and even the packager value of it, but to me it's really clear that uh, it is something that lets us uh, maintain a package once and build it across multiple bases. And also uh, for Apple, uh, and you know, CentOS, it, it's a way that we can actually make alternate streams of things available so that if there's a patch that somebody has um, to, a, to a package in RHEL, uh, the, currently the rules in Apple are Apple can't override RHEL at all. With the next version of Apple, the rules are going to be that if you have a module, uh, the, the default stream can't override RHEL, but you can have an alternate stream that can override a RHEL packages. You can Stop opt into this. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's a, that's a super exciting thing that will let us collaborate in a way we haven't been able to before and will uh, uh, enable that feedback loop that Jim wants because we can actually, it can be more than a patch just sitting there in Bugzilla waiting for somebody to apply it. We can actually build those packages and people can use them and then um, it'll be you know, a matter of, you know, a git uh, cherry pick to pull that patch in rather than to if if most of what you want is the absolute latest and greatest you like running fedora oh i was gonna uh, my god um if you want the latest and greatest you're used to running fedora but you need one module that lives a little bit longer so that you can target some development for rel maybe you run fedora with a centos or apple enabled module if you're primarily doing you know, long-term stable stuff, you're used to working on CentOS, but you need PHP to just iterate all the time, you run that module from Fedora built, on, uh, built against either CentOS or Apple, however we have that structured. Module from Fedora or mo module from Apple? Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, Matthew just said Apple can do modules. Or uh -huh. can, can you use mod modules from Fedora as well? In theory, we could be able to tag a module from Fedora into Apple that runs just fine on CentOS. Possibly. In theory. Yeah. Implementation detail. <laughs> Okay, so, I'm not talking static binaries or anything like that or copying across. I'm saying here's one module where we all share the source, build it for these different things so that it runs everywhere. Yeah, so, so just kind of rounding that, did, was your question answered? Okay, so just rounding it out, so there are there are technical enablers and that that increase collaboration, but there's also a social angle. So, but just sticking, kind of rounding out the technical side, uh, modularity, specifically stream branching, to me is is this. It could open up an entire world of difference in the way we do Linux distributions, because is there really a difference between the Firefox that Fedora ships and CentOS ships and and RHEL ships? at least at a source level? Not really. Is there value in differentiation? Not really. What about shared libraries? Like, is, is libblah SO7 really, is there some reason that Fedora should have one set of patches and sent a different and like, I, I think we would just want to kind of increase the, the quality of each one of those versions of a library that are in some way linked to an ecosystem and, and have just the highest quality shared library at, at any major library version. And if we do that, uh, it increases sharing, and, uh, but it pushes all of the problem space to the social side of, of agreeing to do that together. So the question is, who do you need in your community that you do not have right now, and what are you going to do to attract them? So I'm, I'm going to let these folks answer that question, but I want to start by kind of setting a base. 
Um, one of the things that has changed in the last, I believe it's the last year, but it may be slightly longer, is that one of my colleagues, Rich Bowen, is serving as the community counterpart to me in CentOS. And one of the things that we have been able to do with the Red Hat support and sponsorship that we get is he and I work very closely together to try and help these communities start a conversation between themselves. And one of our long-term goals is to try and get people to stop having two versions of the exact same meeting where they pretend they didn't just have this conversation an hour ago so they could use a different Zodbot. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to do because from a community perspective, I look at the communities, and we had the measles slide up earlier, but I look at it as there is a huge group of people in Fedora that would, CentOS would benefit from having their insight. And there is a massive group of CentOS people who Fedora would benefit from their insight. And that's the conversation that Rich and I are trying to figure out how to have. And if you haven't been to the Fedora booth, get one of our innovation bags that has both logos on it because they're awesome. And now I'll let these guys speak to the specific things that they see within the community. And I'm gonna let Matthew start. Let Jim start, he sounded like he wanted to. All right. I, I like where you went with that because I think that one of the one of the things that within CentOS we need the most are developers. CentOS as a community has been, no, I'm not going to do the developer, developer, developer chant. Um, we have primarily been a community focused around operations. We pick up sysadmins, we pick up SREs, we don't pick up developers and we struggle with that because a lot of times our skill set revolves around, hey, we made you know, 60,000 machines work fairly flawlessly. Thank you, Daddy Shadow Man, for some of the support and some of the code. Um, but the developer aspect for, hey, we need a new website designer, we need some software that does this one piece, now suddenly we're looking around like, but, but we don't have a bunch of Python developers running around. We don't have some of the, the different um, folks that Fedora does for the community or developer aspect, we're mostly an ops shop. So we could benefit from some of the developers that Fedora has and some of the community focus that Fedora has to offset our skill set. And I think that applies in kind of the opposite direction as well. Uh, yes, all of that. Um, I think uh, one of the, like if I could like make people magically show up to work on things in Fedora, I think the the largest thing I'm worried about right now is some of our uh, not the engineering and development on the operating self it, uh, operating system itself part because I think we, we've got that working pretty well. We could always use more, but there's a lot of things around like our websites, uh, documentation, um, you. Know, the uh, mindshare outreach kind of things, connecting people together, uh, making it easier to get started, finding different use cases and talking about them. Um, we we need to build up that community more and more because I think that's that that's one of the things that as like the the excitement of an operating system like Linux distros you know in the 90s that was a cool thing to be working on if you were a you know, certain set of cool um, but uh, but uh, but it, it really isn't so much anymore like if you want to go make a name for yourself in open source like I'm going to go work on a Linux distro is you know, quirky um, and. Uh, I would love to make that cool again, and I would like to, um, to have the community around that. That's you know not just the developer community, not just the engineering community, but there's so much more we need that um, I would like to build up. So Laura's question was about the people that we need, but I think in order to answer that, you have to answer what are the activities that need to be done, and there, there's there's kind of two classes of them. There's the kind of driving policy changes because Fedora has one set of policies that are kind of Fedora-centric and Cent has its and Rail has its. So there's like creating compatible policies and then there's just like some, some technical things that come out of that. So if stream branching is the way that we create a differential between the distributions, then we need to have things like common branch naming semantics and that kind of thing. So really it just comes down to a little bit of technical leadership a little bit of, of uh, kind of social leadership, creating compassion and empathy between the distributions. So, uh, relatedly, like, uh, to, I think, um, the, there was a bunch of talk about, like, how 
it's unclear to a lot of people how Fedora leads and Rel leads and CentOS and comes back and, and, and that's in the like arguably more simple world where you don't have modules that can like cross compile across all of these different distros. And so if you if you have a world in which any given module or stream, and the terminology is still fuzzy in my head, uh, may be available on different distros, but may come from like one place or the other place, I think one of the concerns I have is that like the enablement here is amazing. And if you happen to know the magical version of this module on this stream is available for this thing from this thing, which will solve this problem, like, like it seems like all of the sort of uh, technical underpinnings are now being kind of built. But how do you how do you surface to people who aren't like deep into one of these communities? How the fuck you put all of these pieces together in a way that solves your problem? Right? Like we'll probably know because like I happen to know most of you people. Like and I can like you or email you, but like, what if I didn't? Like, how do I, how do you how do you how do you get this information out in a like sane way? Sure. So uh, let me rephrase. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take your question. I'm gonna twist it just a little bit. So take all <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Like that. I'm good with that. Um, so here, let me let me take this. So Laura asked a great question. We talked about tech, technical enablers. We asked, you know, who do we need to show up? So what do contributors get out of it? Right, like you do this, but then there's a confusion around modularity, how it works, if you're new to it, right? So that kind of leads into this question as well. Um, I will say that there's some modularity talks later in the day, so if you want to understand the technical underpinnings, then please attend those. Uh, I think Langdon White and Stephen Gallagher are doing those talks, uh, and they will be able to answer, like, how do you know what stream is available and stuff like that. Um, it's, not, it's not quite as confusing as it sounds because the module build service kind of makes it easier to do. It's not that you have this. I was exaggerating for it. Right, exactly, right? So, so, but I think your point underlying that is what do contributors get out of it? How are they going to know how to participate and things like that? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. So, what are they going to get out of it? How are they going to know how to help? You guys say you have needs. What are they going to get out of it in return? I actually get to talk. That's sweet. Um, first, I want to apologize for using my phone behind his back. I'm also helping run this conference, and my phone exploded, and I needed to know why. Um, so one of the things that I would start with is completely non-technical. If there's not a feedback loop, then why do I keep showing up? If my contribution matters, people need to be reading it. I need to see that it goes somewhere. Um, and that is a, a key thing that I think all of our communities have struggled with at times in various different areas where, you know, somebody well-meaning shows up and really does the right thing and gets zero. I mean, it's like crick even the crickets are actually gone. You get like their out of office message. Um, so that is a key thing that I think that we need to drive here that I wanted to emphasize and apologize for my phone with. So. So I think it just kind of goes to the question of why do you want a community in the first place? If you're participating in one, if, if we can create some sort of feedback loop, if we can create some sharing, you're actually just expanding the, the potential pool of community contributors. So if you want a community, if you want feedback, if you want patches, if you want bug fixes, if you want interaction with the greater world, then you know, I think we're, we're better united than as three independent, completely independent, disassociated entities. It's disingenuous. It's disingenuous to think of us as three separate uh, communities to begin with. I mean, how, how many people here have Fedora on a laptop right now? From those people who SSH is to a sent or rel box to do work. All right, we're all using it. We're all overlap. There's there's a pretty significant Venn diagram of community going on here. So, if we stop pretending that we're all separate and we start sharing, that makes things a little better and a little easier. So we don't have just one person trying to throw a patch into Fedora or into Sent. Quick follow-on question. Do we have any package maintainers in here? All right. I want you to keep your hand up if you maintain packages in uh, two distributions. So. There's four total, so RHEL, CentOS, Apple, Fedora. Two? All right, we still have about half the hands up. Three? Still have a few hands up. So, four? All right, nobody does four, but there's a good chunk that do three. 
most people that do one do, do two also. So, but treating as two different things means you have two different policy sets to keep track of, schedules, all this other stuff that it, it's just kind of wasted administrative stuff. We're, we don't do this for administration. We want to hack on code. We want to do cool stuff. And to touch on one piece from your question, having one central Git structure that builds across everything except RHEL um, <laughs> kind of makes things a bit simpler as well. Instead of go here for CentOS, go here for Fedora, um, putting it all in one basket, unifying it, and then as a side effect of that, spreading it out geographically so we can get some better performance and you're not just tied to one specific thing. Oh, Phoenix is offline. Great, I'm stuck. Now we can have we can have a split between Phoenix. We can have a split between Raleigh. We can you know put some uh, a couple other places once we start yeah. getting that in. Yeah. We we could absolutely kind of possibly yes, make that happen. Kind of All right. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, you want to talk to it at all? No, Kurt, I think it's you're good. Close. Okay. So I actually have one more question, but we're we're about ten minutes before the end of the session. I want to make sure there's time for any questions you guys have. So. Questions? Raise your hand if you think this is crazy and we're, we're out of our minds. <laughs> okay. Keep your hands up, though, if crazy is why you want to be part of it. Okay. That's, Sweet. That's yeah. <laughs> All right. That's cool. That's cool. So nobody has any questions? Because I do have one more for this group, and they have no idea what it is. Well, now we want to know what the cost of question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Jim and Eddie, you're working pretty hard on So the question was, when do we think the um, shared CentOS and Fedora disk git repo will see the light of day? That's something that I legitimately cannot answer. Uh, <laughs> the CentOS work for that is mostly done apart from some final sign-off. The Fedora work for that is mostly done apart from, from some final sign-off. The problem is the rel source code pushes directly into our git structure. That's outside of our control. And as part of the new technology, or as part of this new system, we had to make a couple of tweaks to how that happened. And when we went to the internal folks for Red Hat who were dealing with that, they looked at us and said, but I have this list of product things I have to happen to make RHEL 8 beta an actual thing and get in line. So I, I don't know yeah. what the timetable looks like for that. And, and I, can, I can add just a little bit of that. Um, so how many of you have tried the beta, RHEL 8 beta? So that's a good portion. Yay. <laughs> thanks. That's what I work on, so thanks. <laughs> um, so in there, obviously, we have modules, right? And so as part of distributing the source, it's a, it's a drastic difference from how we, we ship the source to CentOS for RHEL 7, because now you can't just push the latest MVR of the RPMs because you have multiple streams. And so there's actually code that has to be written on the, the internal side to get the source delivery for the streams correct so they don't overwrite each other. Um, and the teams that were responsible for doing that were also the teams responsible for getting the beta out the door. So, um, all right, cool, good question. Any other questions? What are you guys going to do when uh, Red Hat switches to Debs in RHEL 9? <laughs> what are we going to do when Red Hat switches to Debs in RHEL 9? My answer to that question is we'll be perfectly prepared because all these communities will have switched before that. Oh. <laughs> We are not. We're gonna go. We're gonna go packageless. It'll be a new like serverless. It's packageless, right? In JSON. In JSON. No, Wait. it'll be it'll be something else. So Slackware again? Yeah, Slackware. <laughs> Big old circle. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. So really the case here? Is that, I, I use that as a blanket statement. Sorry, Jim. Uh, I meant on CentOS as well. So the, the question was, it, it do, we need, do we need infrastructure engineers and not necessarily packagers? And I actually think the answer is no. 
we have a lot of infrastructure engineers. Um, Jim employs some of them. Uh, Paul Frields, who's not here, employs another set of them. Um, Mike employs all of them, which is kind of funny. But <laughs> so there's definitely yeah. So the, there's we talked about website work, um, scripts and stuff like that. Yeah. So we we have lots of great packagers, and we're always happy to have more of them. And we have fantastic, amazing infrastructure people, and we're always happy to have more of them. And in fact, one of my big requests of of the Mike employed individuals has been make it easier for people who don't work for Mike to help you as well. Yeah. But the other side of this is that, yeah, documentation, websites, but also people who want to show up and make more measles. Um, yeah. Because, quite frankly, there's an audience of people who want to go help llama farmers, and we'd like to be their OS of choice because we know that we can deliver the value over time for the llama farming community. And we need those folks to be able to show up and be successful, even if their primary skill set involves determining the gender of a llama. Um, there will always be llamas out there. That's yes. right. right. Uh, and, and saying, though, is there Okay, how many, how many people in the audience maintain a package? We, we had hands up for that. How many people in the audience write documentation? Prior, you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> how many of those people are lying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how many, that's that's so, the real question. Yeah. Legitimately, we do have a documentation shortfall. And right now, if you, if you pull up... Uh, Google and you start looking for documentation for I want to do this on Linux on a laptop you get arch you get arches wiki it's good information that's there but you don't get the Fedora documentation you don't get the rel documentation that's a problem where we've got a weak spot because we've been focused kind of inside and focusing on the tooling and making the tooling and the packaging fantastic but broader community, bigger picture, we need the documentation. That draws people in. So like, I think that's absolutely true. We need those things. I think the purpose of this panel, the purpose of the talk originally, is that we need people to start buying into change, right? We're not trying to force change because it's cool and new and we want to reinvent the world. We're trying to force change because we think we can do better. And, and a lot of the communities and a lot of interaction we have hasn't changed, as Matthew said, in a very long time. And so that's kind of what like if you take away anything from any of this conversation, I would hope that it's, hey, we're trying to do something that makes collaboration, feedback, and your actual engineering jobs if you work across these distros easier, even if it's going to be harder up front, right? Okay, any other questions? Okay, we have about four minutes left, so we're going to move on to this one. So yeah, like this, this kind of gets to that. What happens if, if none of this happens, in your opinion? If we leave this room today and everybody says, those guys are all crazy, they're Lord of the Rings fans and we hate them, what are we going to do? Like, what happens? Um, oh. hey, let me think while you, somebody else talks. See, I told you. <laughs> they had not seen these yeah. slides. This is fun. Oh, all right. I, no, I think we we fade away into irrelevance basically because we're because the you know the changes you're talking about we're not changing just for fun or just to like we could do cool new stuff we're changing because the world is changing and users needs are changing and what people want out of what we're providing changes and so we need to adapt to that and this is a better structure to adapt to how the world is changing and what our users actually need so if we are not able to do that um, we become a project that is very inward focused and we're only working on the things that the people who are already here are working on and eventually we will all get more and more gray in our beards and then die and the um, you know that that's we, we need the next generation of people who are interested in the same kind of problems but in a different way to come on board yeah I agree with Matt, what Matthew said, but I would also say proprietary software then succeeds. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait, we've put been, some color. Hang on. I want you to elaborate because we have been saying in multiple places uh, across multiple open source projects that open source has won, right? And so how do, how do we go from open source has won to if we change nothing, proprietary software succeeds? Yeah, well, they thought they had defeated Sauron before, but he came back. The ring was discovered. Like, it, it doesn't <laughs> end, right? I mean, we had a head start. We had all of the stuff from, from like, System 5 Unix and BSD that, that eventually the, the hole is greater than some of the parts. Or no, some of the parts are greater than the hole. But uh, in the end, it, even though distributions are awesome, I love working on operating system distributions. I've done it my entire life. Uh, if look at uh, iOS, look at Android. It came out much later, and sure, there's a little like, kernel on the Android side, but there are millions of applications, millions of them, They've had this incredible growth spurt, and while Fedora is still growing, RHEL is still growing, Sense is still growing, it's it's exponentially smaller. So if if we continue to have like linear growth, and the, the rest of the world has exponential growth, eventually our linear growth will plateau and get smaller because making an operating system isn't isn't a thing most people have to do anymore. They get to do applications and stuff. So. Uh, so you want RHEL on mobile phones that is a plateau. <laughs> Red Hat embedded light bulbs, yes. All right, just to point out, we have one minute left, and I have one very important question left, so hurry up. You know what? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, all right. I, I have an answer to this, too, and I'm going to try to make it quick. So what happens if nothing happens? I think... That was an amazing question. I know, but like, I'm, we're going to get to the amazing question. Um, I worry that... So, Mike, you, had, you did a keynote last year, or maybe it was the year before, where you talked about the Kodak Eastman. Uh, that was an internal thing, but it was good. It was good. <laughs> no, your Thriller was your thing last year. Anyway, so as quick as I can, Kodak kind of went downhill, right, because they focused on film, and then digital cameras came along, right? It kind of goes back to what Brennan was saying. And I worry that if we do nothing, if we don't pay attention to what's happening, uh, the same thing will happen to us, right? Like we're we're going to be continuing to make these really cool film cameras that nobody's using anymore. Um, the key part of that was they they became number one in camera sales in 2005. <coughs> and what happened in 2007? The iPhone came out. Yep. And then seven years later, they declared bankruptcy. Yep. Like they weren't ahead. They finally got ahead, and it was too late. Yep. Uh, so. We took a lot of questions tonight. Thank you for participation. Uh, and here's the last question, guys. If we do this, will you attend next year's DevConf dressed as your Lord of the Ring character? Nope. I will totally do that because Aragorn is a badass. I ever have to watch it. You've never so seen I, the I movie? I, I was forced to watch them one day all in sequence and they're better in Klingon and it's terrible. Oh, you guys are no fun. No I fun. I will watch just uh, about right, anything Josh else with anyone in the room. You but heard I'll it. Come dressed as am, am I that allowed to bring enough. the axe? Am I allowed to bring the axe? Yes, you can totally bring the axe.